All right, hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about introduction to winemaking. So some fun stuff today. We're just going to cover, you know, how, how all of our favorite styles of wine are made, starting with red wine. So getting down to it, what is wine? Fermented grapes, of course. So for red wine specifically, we're talking about the juice fermented with grape skins, seeds, all together, and that combination is called grape must. So skin contact during the fermentation is what gives red wine that beautiful color. Uh, that's why there's so much variation in color. It's just all the different varieties, the amount of extraction from the skins during fermentation, the climate, and so much more. So lots of beauty there. For a white wine, um, that's typically made just fermented grape juice. So we press the grapes. There are no skins present, no color present because of that. So just fermenting just the juice. Uh, rosé wine can be made in a couple different ways. It could be uh, red grapes that were crushed and left with the skins for just a couple hours and then pressed and fermented. And it could be a finished white wine that some red wine is blended into. So and then we're going to learn a couple other different ways for that too in this lecture. But I just want to start off with how red wine is made. Um, this lecture might be a little redundant for some folks, but for those who haven't worked in the industry, it's really nice to see step by step what's going on and exactly um, what is happening. So for part one, how red wine is made, we have some basic steps. Uh, you need to harvest the fruit, of course. We need to crush and destem the fruit. Then we go through primary fermentation, which converts all the sugar into alcohol. Then we press. So we extract all of the fer newly fermented wine off of the skins out of the tank. We typically put it into a barrel and that's where it goes through secondary fermentation. Uh, secondary fermentation can be done in a tank as well. But at this stage, uh, we're converting malic to lactic acid. Don't worry, we're going to talk about this all. Then we have racking, barrel aging, blending, filtering, and finally bottling. So that is just a very rough overview of the process for red wine. Um, here's a nice little picture for that that just makes it a little bit easier to put together in our brains. So, of course, you harvest the fruit. It gets crushed and destemmed. The fruit gets thrown in this hopper here, and then it comes out the bottom portion of this equipment, uh, and then the stems come out the back end. So the stems come out. The freshly crushed grapes with the skins and all the seeds come into this little auger, and that gets pumped right into a tank. It ferments in the tank with the skins and everything. That's where it gets its beautiful color. After it's finished fermenting and all of that sugar is turned to alcohol, we press. After pressing, we this is the process that removes the skins from the juice or the newly fermented wine. All that lovely liquid gets in, put into a tank or barrels and it goes through the second fermentation. Once that's complete, we have blending, we have aging, and then we have all of the fun wine chemistry of finding and filtering and bottling. So hopefully that kind of puts it into perspective. So step one, harvesting the grapes, of course. So the grapes are picked in ideal condition for that style of wine. We've talked a lot about this in the past couple of lectures. Uh, we talked about bricks, acid content, and pH, and how it all just really depends on the style of wine that you are trying to make. So um, we also talked about the progression of flavors that can be developed in grapes depending on when they're harvested. So that's just another throwback right here. So I feel pretty good about that. So once you've decided the perfect time to harvest, that's when the grapes come in. You do harvest, then you crush and destem. So you dump the berries into the crusher destemmer, which is what the machine is called. And it breaks open the berries, removes the stems, and we pump everything into a tank. And this is when we really start the what's called maceration process. Maceration is the practice of leaving skins in contact with the juice so all the colors, tannins, and flavors are extracted into the fermenting wine. So um, the product of this cr crushing process is called must. So the grapes are crushed and destemmed, turns into must. The must gets pumped into a tank where maceration occurs. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so once that happens, we commence with primary fermentation. So we add yeast to our must, and all of that yeast starts to consume all the sugars 
and it starts to put out carbon dioxide, heat, and alcohol. So like we said yeast is, is really working up here. So uh, during that time, the heat um, helps to extract the colors and flavors from the grape skins. The fruity flavors are really developing and tannins are extracted from the skins and seeds of the grape as well. So this is the bread and butter of a new vintage. This is the birth of the new vintage, this process. It's very exciting. So during this process, while the tank is heating up and the yeast is you know, converting all the sugars to alcohol, it's extremely important that we do pump overs. So pump overs is exactly what it sounds. It's called pumping over a tank. So we hook up a pump to the bottom of the tank. We pump the juice over the top of the mus. And we what's happening here is during the fermentation, all the carbon dioxide pushes the skins to the top of the tank. It creates what we call a cap. So a pump over will wet the cap. So you're reintroducing the liquid with the skins where all that awesome flavor and color is coming from and hoping to get the best extraction possible. So mix the tanks. Uh, sometimes if a tank is too hot, you can do an extended pump over to help cool it down. So you're introducing that hot must to air. So that way it's helping to cool it down. Um, also in smaller situations, there is something very similar called a punch down. So as you can see from this picture here is we have someone with a little punch down stick that has a flat paddle at the bottom and they're just re-wetting the cap. They're punching down the top some people do it with their bare hands. I wouldn't recommend it because the acids from grapes are really harmful to your skin. Uh, you can dry out your skin and stain your hands from the red wine as well. So, but it's up to you. So both of these are done during primary fermentation, also known as alcoholic fermentation. So both are very, very important. We do them multiple times throughout the day. Pressing. So once we're done with all of our fermentations, for a red, it typically takes about a week, sometimes a little bit more, depending on what you're doing. So say a red wine is done fermenting after a week, then it comes time to press. So we will drain off all of the newly fermented wine from that tank. Then we'll shovel out all the leftover skins that are left in there. We'll put all those skins into a press. And then um, we will do the act of pressing where we remove any leftover wine that's in those skins to get the most that we can out of it. And when those skins come out, it's actually called pumice. So must becomes pumice once all the liquid is removed. And those are typically thrown out into the vineyard for compost. Um, and at that point, the newly fermented wine is pumped into a barrel or another tank that's clean and ready for it and is prepared for secondary fermentation. So. Secondary fermentation, also known as malolactic fermentation, is so instead of converting sugar to alcohol, at this point we're converting um, an acid into a different acid. So we're taking malic acid, converting it to lactic acid. So malic acid is insinuated by the name mal or mal in Spanish, which is bad, is a very harsh and tart acid. Lactic acid is, uh, is what's found in like dairy products like yogurt. So this conversion, we do it for many reasons, which we'll find out when we get into the actual lecture for malolactic fermentation, but it's a conversion of two acids. It's a stability reaction for the wine, but it also just creates a really creamier, smoother mouthfeel for the wine as well. So this can be done in a barrel, can be done in a tank. Um, and in the process, more carbon dioxide is released. So if you can't remember what the conversion is, the answer is in the name malolactic fermentation going from malic to lactic. Malolactic fermentation. It's a beautiful thing. So here's a little breakdown of the chemistry process. So here's malic acid, which is like we said, it's very tart. It's in present and like unripe and very green apples. What we have here are these two portions of this compound are circled. This is a uh, carboxylic acid. So we have um, two oxygens and OH. This is the acid group. How this, this is how this would be portrayed in organic chemistry. So during the process of malolactic fermentation, we add a bacteria and it consumes malic acid. It cleaves off this carboxylic acid from one of the tails, releases it as carbon dioxide, and what's left after this is kind of munched on is lactic acid. And so this is a lot smoother and a lot more pleasant to our uh, taste buds. 
So that is the reaction that's happening. Then LAB is just short for lactic acid bacteria. That's the type of bacteria that um, consume this. Perfect. So during this reaction, um, we normally talk about this in red wines. You, we do see malolactic fermentation happening in white wines sometimes too. So think of uh, like buttery Chardonnays, uh, creamy Viognier's. If a wine tastes like butter and if it feels kind of heavier in your mouth, it has most likely gone through malolactic fermentation. So um, this is a stylistic thing that we can do with whites. We don't do it with all whites, but we can do with whites. So um, like we said most white wines are not taken through malolactic fermentation. This helps preserve crisp, fruity, and citrus flavors. If we did put a white wine through malolactic fermentation, it would become more buttery. Oftentimes, these wines uh, are typically put in oak barrels as well. So, like buttery, oaky Chardonnay would be your best example for that. Perfect. So, racking out. At this point, so we're still on track for red wine, right? At this point, once malolactic fermentation's over or secondary fermentation, uh, we will rack. So we're going to clean out the barrels. All of the excess uh, yeast and bacteria that is left from that wine will settle on the bottom. So we'll very carefully pump over the clean wine out of that and then we'll clean out the barrels or the tank that it's in. So and this is what you see on the ground. This is Lee's and this was uh, some petite Syrah barrels. That's why it's so dark and purple. Um, Yes. So then at that point, the clean wine is either put back into a barrel or it can be put back into a tank and it continues down the aging process. Perfect. So next we're going to move on to how white and rosé wines are made. Uh, lots of different styles can be made here as well. And even though we have such a focus on red wines, there are a lot of really sophisticated, beautiful whites and rosés out there. So just look at all the different color possibilities. Um, so lots of fun things. So white wine um, can be a little simpler of a process than red wine. It's definitely a faster turnover for wineries. So it actually benefits a winery on a business standpoint to offer a wide variety of wines. So like reds, you'll have to age. So you'll have more of an overhead cost before releasing those. Uh, whites, you can release the following year. You know, you could harvest right now in September and you can have it bottled by November, or December, uh, depending on how diligent you were with the process. So for whites, you harvest the grapes and then most of the time we send those grapes direct to press. So we'll do a whole cluster. The stems kind of act as a pressing aid most of the time. If the grapes are really green and underripe, sometimes the stems can provide bitterness. But if the fruit is healthy and ripe, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, at this point, we do something called settling. This is a process where, you know, all of that, you know, kind of like yuck and filth that was on the grapes. You know, when we harvest grapes, it's not a sterile product. It comes, comes off the land. So dust and whatever, you know, goodness just naturally occurs. So all of that gunk will settle to the bottom of the tank. And then sometimes we'll rack that off after a couple days just to start with a clean product for fermentation. So sometimes we do that. But once we have that, once we have our clarified juice product, we will add the yeast and start primary fermentation. So we're converting all of the sugar into alcohol again, it's releasing carbon dioxide. The big difference here with white versus red is reds release heat from fermentation and we like that heat because it helps extract the tannins. Since we're fermenting just a white juice, we actually, for white wine, want to ferment it cold and slow because we don't have any skins to give us any flavors. All of the aromatics that we get are from the juice itself. So we want to ferment it cold and slow to preserve all of those beautiful like floral, fruity, citrus aromatics. If a white wine just ferments too fast and gets too hot, it actually loses a lot of that character. And once you lose it, it's gone. So that's how the fermentation is a little bit different. Cold and slow for a white wine, um, you know, hot for a red wine. Okay, then we have here on this chart malolactic. Um, that's optional. Like we said, if you want a buttery Chardonnay or like a creamy wine, you can put it through malolactic. Uh, if, if you don't, you're pretty much done at this point. You would just, you would pump off the clean wine after it's done with fermentation, do a little bit of wine chemistry to preserve it, 
and then you could be ready for you know stability and bottling. But if you did take it through malolactic, convert all of the malic acid to lactic acid, create that buttery character, you could put it in a barrel during this malolactic process and do a process called surly, which we have here as sterlies in English. And this is all of that leftover yeast and bacteria from the fermentations. And this process, you take a little wand and you stir the inside of the barrel and all of those cells from the yeast and bacteria start to break down and release all of these like fatty lipids and like all these like mouth coating delicious fatty flavors and that's that's the beauty of that process so if you wanted to utilize that creaminess um, that's how you do that so after that process was complete in the barrel and you decided to rack it once it reached the desired flavors and tastes you could uh, rack it, filter it, blend it, bottle it, and send it out to market. So that's where it gets a little uh, more complicated with the creamy white wines. But yeah, that's the general process. So here is just putting all of that wonderful information into text for you guys so you can visually read what I was talking about as well. So if you have any questions, definitely um, just shoot me an email or you'll see me in class. So either way. Okay, moving on to rosés. Rosés are some of the most interesting things to make because it really is like a hybridized form of making a red and a white. So there is one of the most common ways and traditional ways to make a rosé is to start with a red grape variety. You crush those red grapes and you leave it on the skins for just a small amount of time. So some people do it for, you know, two hours, 24 hours, 72 hours. Obviously, the longer you leave it on that juice, the more flavor it extracts, but it also extracts some tannin in that process too. So depending on the style you want, you don't want to overdo it. So there's a general, general hour, general like window of like 10 to 48 hours just depending on the level of extraction and the variety. So once you've reached that concentration or that blush color extraction that you want from the juice, you want to press it. And you don't want this, you don't want this must fermenting on the skins. You want it to stay cold, very, very cold. You want just to extract color, then you want to press. And by the time you press, the juice already looks pink, which is awesome. Then you take that juice, pump it into a tank, and you start fermenting it as if you would a white wine. So nice and cold and nice and slow to preserve all of those beautiful flavors. Cool. So there's actually three different ways a rosé rose could be made. What I walked you through is the you know, very traditional process of using red grapes. So like we said, juice is left on the skin for a short amount of time to extract some color. Then it's pressed and fermented. So an alternative method is kind of like, sometimes we call like the poor man's method or just kind of the easy, easy method is you can, and this is totally legal, you can take a white wine and you can uh, just spill a small amount of red wine into it. You can either do that with finished products or you can do it before fermentation. Um, sometimes it happens on accidents, <laughs> not actually not very often, but if an intern were to dump some wine red wine into a white tank, you would be stuck with the rosé, but that is totally legal as long as you display it correctly on your label what that wine is, uh, or if you just give it a fanciful name, you can do that too. But then we have a third method, which is fun, which is called saunier, which is a French derived method, and that is bleeding off juice from a tank of red must and fermenting it separately. So this is a very advantageous style of winemaking. So Saunier comes from a very, very, very old belief of bleeding off. So when people were sick, um, they believed that this like disease or sickness in you, like if you, if you like tapped off some of your blood, your body would go into like regeneration mode and it would help get rid of that sickness or whatever that was that was making you feel ill. Uh, we know better now, um, but that's the process is kind of similar. So, saunier just means to bleed off. So, if that helps you remember it all, then awesome. So, what we would do is we would take, say, let's say I get um, 20 tons of Pinot Noir, and it comes into the winery, 
and um, you know it's a light red variety and I really just want a really beautiful concentrated uh, Pinot Noir for this product that's my goal so I bring in these 20 tons of Pinot Noir we crush and destem and we put it into we put that must into a tank and you know we have when you do that you have a ratio of liquid to skins and say say we have this tank of of must and I decide to tap off of that you know 300 gallons of juice so just juice the skin stay in the tank so now what we've done is we've tapped off some juice and put it on the side and it's already kind of like a pinkish color because it's been in contact with the skins and now I have a tank with a higher juice to skin ratio so all the flavors from the skins will make it a much more concentrated wine and so what happens is I have a concentrated wine red wine and then I take that pink juice we tapped off on the side and we create a rosé we ferment that separately and we make a rosé so now the result of this process is two wines you have a red wine with more concentrated flavor and then you have a rosé bada bing bada boom you have two wines to sell in two different styles and the thought process is hopefully both of them will be fantastic so it's a win-win situation um, if it works out for you I read about 10 to 20 percent uh, juice removal is typical so you don't want to take more than 20 percent of your total like volume uh, after that it becomes really hard to work with the with the tank because it's not so fluid it's hard to do pump overs or anything like that um, so we'll see how it goes there was a study done by the Australian Wine Research Institute which I have linked here that um, showed that the 20 percent Saunier was not considered better than 10% on red wines. So, you know, tapping off more than 10% didn't make that higher, that much higher of a quality of wine, according to their studies. So, food for thought. Cool. And then here's just another visual representation of what that meant, um, just to help all of you visual folks out there. Perfect. And then, last but not least, we have sparkling wine. Um, which I have a little link for you guys here. Sparkling wine is fantastic. You know, a lot of us still call it champagne. Champagne can only come from Champagne of France unless you were um, somehow loopholed into a law, which some American companies are, um, thanks to one of the world wars. So for sparkling wine, is which most of us call it here in the United States, is uh, typically harvested slightly unripe to keep the acidity in the wine. The carbon dioxide is what makes it fizzy, just like sodas. Uh, it can be bubbled indirectly, but it can also be produced by yeast during fermentation. And that's kind of the big difference for how some of these styles are made. So the very first way a sparkling wine can be made is called ancestral method, which is also known as Petnat, which is short for uh, Petalant Naturel, which we'll get into. Then we have the traditional method, which is also called Method Champenoise, which is a French. And then we have a tank method, which is also card called Charmat process. So we'll walk through those a little bit. So Petnat, uh, also known as ancestral method, also known as Petalant Natural, which means naturally effervescent, which is a huge indicator on how this wine is made. This is a really big deal right now in the Bay Area. This is kind of like the new trending, it's coming back in style, hipster wine for the region and the traditional way to make this is uh, fermenting the juice of a certain grape variety in a tank only partially then once it's fermented partially it's bottled and it's allowed to complete its fermentation in the bottle today we have some pet gnats that are riddled and disgorged so there's no yeast left over it's a, it's a clean product uh, some of the styles may keep that lees totally not harmful totally fine uh, you can consume it and in general it can be around half the effervescence of a traditional sparkling it's oftentimes find, found with the bottle cap top um, but there's no um, you know sure way on that so it, it might so not some that you might find might have more effervescence so that is just kind of the ancient method of just we're gonna let ferment it part of the way we're gonna bottle it it's gonna keep fermenting and that's how it gets this kind of beautiful fun bubbly flavor and in general like they are drank relatively young and they're fun 
and fruity. Sometimes if the lees is left in the bottle, it can develop almost like a beer-like taste. Like I've had a couple of Chenin Blancs that are pet nap that started to develop almost like a lager-like flavor. Um, but they're just really fun and, you know, people really enjoy them. So keep an eye out for those. Okay, on to traditional method. So traditional method is the process by which, you know, champagne and also kava and other famous wines are made. Uh, kava tends to be a lot less expensive than champagne, by the way. So fun fact, but made in the same process, but with different grape varieties. So this would include fermenting a white wine into completion. So you start with a base white wine. This white wine is often called a cuvee because it's a blend of white wines. They take a bunch of different white wines, blend it together to create just like this beautiful base blend. Once you've created this finished white wine as a base blend, the wine is bottled and it with that comes a tirage. So you can see in this picture here, you take a base wine, you bottle it, you add the tirage. So the tirage is a very specific calculated amount of sugar and yeast. And what that's going to do is that's going to create the carbonation in that sparkling wine. So the amount of pressure that it takes to, to create a champagne, the right amount of yeast and sugar are done to do that. Then um, this is held into a storage facility that's cold. So that way the fermentation is cold and slow and also ages. About two years uh, can be typical for a lot of champagnes, but you can age champagne for a very, very long time. Uh, and that's what makes it much, much more and more expensive. So these bottles are aging with the yeast inside of them. Um, and that's what's giving it kind of this bread-like um, yeasty flavor that's highly desirable in a lot of champagnes. So once the fermentation in the bottle is complete and we've gone through the aging process, we go through something called riddling and disgorging. So this is the time when we decide, okay, this wine is a great product. We are ready to uh, bottle it and start selling it. So we have the bottles aged with the lees in them currently. They need to be riddled. So the riddling process is manipulating the orientation of the bottle. So that way you can get all of the yeast at the very, very top on the cap. So oftentimes if you go to sparkling wine facilities, you can see these cages, we call them cages. They hold um, many cases of wine. I think it's almost a pallet. I think it's like 40 cases of wine uh, per each cage. And these will actually, these are actually on a timer and they slowly rotate and start to form and start to move upward. So the bottles are completely upside down and all of the yeast is at the top. So that's the riddling process. Once the bottles are completely riddled and all of the yeast has been collected at the upper neck, they are put into a neck freezer where this lees cap becomes just like a solid cap of frozen lees and then it's disgorged. The disgorging process is opening up the bottle and then all of the pressure just shoots that frozen puck out because it's got nowhere else to go. So that's the disgorging. After it's been disgorged, there is a final concentration of sugar and sulfur added to the wine so it doesn't start fermenting even more. It's done very, very quickly. The dosage is your final amount of you know, residual sugar for the sweetness on the style of wine that you want to sell. So there's a huge, huge array of that. Uh, but that is what the dosage is. Oops. Okay, next slide, please. Perfect. So here are the different um, dosage rates in champagne and sparkling wines. So this is definitely followed by champagne houses and um, you'll see like these same terms apply to sparkling wines in America too. So the absolute lowest of low sugars, you can see in this little picture, you have the little sugar scoop at the bottom of this glass. The absolute low of low is something called the brute nature. So that means that absolutely no dosage was added at the end of that process and what you are tasting is what that base sparkling wine is. Then you have <clears throat> what's called bone dry or extra brute. So this is also bone dry, but there's a range, right? It can be between zero and six grams per liter. So you can, if your wine is zero, you can add up to six. Then we have brute, which is still considered dry, but it can be anywhere between zero to 12 grams per liter. Then we have extra dry, which is often known as kind of like where the fruitiness comes in. And that's anywhere between 12 to 17 grams per liter 
Then we have dry, uh, demi-sec, and dough. Dough is the absolute sweetest. That is like dessert sparkling wine. Which, <coughs> excuse me, the right occasion is, um, is good. So yeah, lots of different names. But you can also see here like the difference between brute nature, extra brute, and brute. There's a range, right? 0 to 3, 0 to 6, 0 to 12. So if you are marketing your wine and you don't think people will understand what brute nature is or they're going to be shied away from it, you can have a wine that's technically brute nature and you can still label it just as brute. So, um, and that would be in the category with all the other brutes that could be sweeter than yours. So just a little fun marketing thing there. Things you got to think about when you run a business. Okay, and then last but not least, we have Charmat method, which is also known as the tank method. So this is also taking a base wine. So you just have a, you know, general, say you have a tank of Chardonnay or something sitting around, it's finished. And you then you add a combination of sugar and yeast. You let it go through a second fermentation in a pressurized tank. And then you just filter and bottle from there. Or in this situation, you can also just um, bubble in some carbon dioxide as well. And that um, for that process, you actually have to label your wine as carbonated wine. It's not sparkling wine. So if you did just bubble CO2 into a tank, that's carbonated wine, not sparkling wine. Cool. Then we have late harvest wines. So we talked a little bit about this um, with uh, grapes and one to pick. And so for late harvest wines, like we learned, it's just as they sound. You pick the grapes late, has a higher sugar content, and it provides very sweet, delicious wines. So we have port style, botrytized wines, sauternes, ice wine, and many more. So we've seen this before. You know, high sugar content in the grapes gives us sweet wines. Raisining and dehydration helps, you know, concentrate those sugars. Late harvest wines are not necessarily fortified. Sometimes they can be, though. It's up to the winemaker. They don't always have higher alcohol. Sometimes they do. Uh, typical varieties, you can do whites, reds. And then uh, we typically will harvest, sorry, arrest the fermentation with a very, very cold temperature and sterile filter. So sterile filter is really key for those wines with residual sugar. Otherwise, it could start fermenting again in the bottle. Cool. Another way you can create those late harvest or even port style wines is you can stop the fermentation by fortifying the, the sweet, you know, wine with a brandy or wine spirits. At, you know, around 16% alcohol, it becomes really difficult for yeast and bacteria to operate just because it's a very toxic environment for them. So by fortifying up to that, you know, in some of these ports and brandies are 18 20% alcohol, um, that would make it a very, very negative environment for any type of microorganism to live. So that is another way to arrest a fermentation is by fortification. Perfect. And then we have our lovely friend Botrytis, last but not least, also known as Noble Rot. And we did talk about this before um, with the uh, mold that it creates and the different honeyed flavors that it leaves behind. Perfect. And then, of course, we would want to leave out our favorite friends, the Sauternes from France. These are made with our Botrytis friends, and they're very ageable, and the color starts to darken as it ages. Perfect. And then we have ice wines, which is a German specialty, but done all over the world in climates that allow it to. And again, this is just another way to concentrate sugar flavors, but this time it's not with botrytis, and it's um, not necessarily leaving it out late, but uh, by freezing the grapes and only harvesting them when they are frozen, so that way the water freezes and the sugar solution is left behind. So it can be very expensive, but very delicious. And we also have a little uh, write-up from Wikipedia for you to see there. Awesome. So I don't have any review questions for you guys today. Definitely just make sure you understand the process of the wines and try to outline it for yourself. Understand the vocab words that we went through that were uh, bolded in the slides. Those are very important. You know, maceration and must and pumice. And hope you found it fun. Look forward to seeing you guys in class. 
And yeah, I'll see you next time.